Good evening and welcome to Tales of Sweetgrass and Trees. I'm Robin Kelsey and I'm Dean of Arts and Humanities here at Harvard and co-convener with my colleague Ian Miller of the Environment Forum at the Mahindra Humanities Center. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you all and to introduce uh, tonight's event, which, by the way, we would have put into Sanders Theater had we known what the demand would be. So lucky you to have a seat. I'm going to begin by um, giving some uh, thanks. This event is co-sponsored by the Center for the Study of World Religions at the Harvard Divinity School and the Mahindra Humanities Center. And I want to thank Charlie Stang, the director of the Center for the Study of World Religions and his staff for doing so much to pull this event together. I want to thank Homi Baba, the director of the Mahindra Humanities Center, his executive director, Steve Beal, and uh, their staff for all their support of this event. And I want to thank Ned Friedman of the Arnold Arboretum and his staff, especially Pam Thompson, as well as the emeritus but still quite vigorous Professor Larry Buell, without whom this gathering would not have come about. There are moments that one wants to hold in suspension, uh, not because one doesn't want to see them unfold, but one simply wants to acknowledge how marvelous it is that this moment has arrived. And for me, this evening is such a moment, and I know the same is true for Ian and uh, Charlie. To have these three incandescent writers, Robin Wall Kimmerer, Richard Powers, and Terry Tempest Williams together for a conversation about giving voice and agency to entities beyond the human is a miraculous tingling boon for this community. And I want to thank them and to thank you all for making this moment happen. I'm going to offer brief introductions of our visitors, radically truncating the prodigious extent of their achievements May I say truncating at this event? Is that, that, that I'm in trouble already. I just, just getting started. Uh, with, with each uh, introduction, I will offer a snippet of their uh, prose, and then I will get out of the way. Robin Wall Kimmerer makes me proud to be a Robin. Uh, a, a plant ecologist, she is SUNY, distinguished teaching professor of environmental biology, a member of the citizen Powhatomi Nation. She is founder and director of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment. Her first book, Gathering Moss, won the John Burroughs Medal for Outstanding Nature Writing. Her recent book, Braiding Sweetgrass, on the teaching of plants has been widely read and beloved, I'm sure, by many in this room. If you are feeling blue, uh, sit and read some of the 519 reviews on Amazon, and the testimonials of inspiration will give you hope. Better yet, read the book or read it again. All we Robins may tweet, but this bird has wings. Sorry, I don't, I don't know if, I'm, if it's getting any better or not, but all right. In the, in the chapter, Burning Cascade Head of Braiding Sweetgrass, Robin writes of the now fragmentary accounts of the venerable Nichesne ceremony welcoming the salmon, a ceremony marked by caretaking and gratitude. She writes about her own walks on Cascade Head, thinking about this ceremony, remembering it. She writes, I drop to my knees in the grass and I can hear the sadness, as if the land itself was crying for its people, come home, come home. There are often other walkers here. I suppose that's what it means when they put down the camera and stand on the headland straining to hear above the wind with that wistful look. 
the gaze out to sea. They look like they're trying to remember what it would be like to love the world. Richard Powers is one of the great novelists of our time. He has written 12 novels on an astonishing array of subjects, garnering innumerable fans around the world and many prizes to pluck just one from his stash. The Echo Maker, his 2006 novel that unravels from a car accident in Nebraska and mingles with Sandhill Cranes, won the National Book Award. His most recent novel, The Overstory, is about the strange powers of trees and their entwinement with humans. It was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize. And Patchett has called it the best novel ever written about trees, and really just one of the best novels, period. In The Overstory, Richard writes at the start of the section entitled The Crown about a man lying on the ground at dawn in the boreal north. The man with head sticking out of the tent asks him, himself, what are those treetops like? They're like that cog tooth drawing toy spinning out surprise patterns from the simplest nested cycles. They're like the tip of a Ouija planchette taking dictation from beyond. They are, in fact, like nothing but themselves. They are the crowns of five white spruces laden with cones, bending in the wind as they do every day of their existence. Likeness is the sole problem of men. But the spruces pour out messages in media of their own invention. They speak through their needles, trunks, and roots. They record in their own bodies the history of every crisis they've lived through. The man in the tent lies bathed in signals hundreds of millions of years older than his crude senses, and still he can read them. Terry Tempest Williams is writer in residence at the Harvard Divinity School. Her many books include the now canonical work of environmental literature, Refuge, and Unnatural History of Family and Place. She has won the Robert Marshall Award from the Wilderness Society and the Wallace Stegner Prize. Last month, the Los Angeles Times announced that Terry would receive the Robert Kirsch Award for Lifetime Achievement by a writer with a substantial connection to the American West. Having Terry at Harvard with us the past two years has been splendid, invigorating, catalytic. In Refuge, she writes of time sitting on the shore of the Great Salt Lake soon after learning that her mother's chemotherapy has not eradicated her cancer. I love to watch gulls soar over the Great Basin. It is another trick of the lake to lure gulls inland. On days such as this, when my soul has been wrenched, the simplicity of flight and form above the lake untangles my grief. Glide the gulls right in the sky, and for brief moments, I do. Hoping to glide and circle this evening with these three great writers, I ask you to please join me in welcoming Robin Wall Kimmerer, Richard Powers, and Terry Tempest Williams. Sorry for all of you. <laughs> Deep breath. Thank you, Robin. What a tweet introduction. <laughs> uh, thank you always for your eloquence. And leadership, emerging of the humanities and the sciences, the social sciences, arts, and religion. Bless you and Ian Miller for your vision of the Environmental Forum an open door to the environmental humanities at Harvard. And my deepest gratitude to Charlie Stang, director of the Center for the Study of World Religions. Without a vision of the earth as sacred text, we are not being responsible to the past, to the future. 
this present moment on this beautiful blue planet we call home. Ned, thank you for the work you're doing and for the conversation you had last night with Robin and with Richard. I hope this is an extension of that. And my deepest respects to Larry Buell. Thank you so much for Walking Point for us. Two extraordinary guests. They are my literary mentors. They are teachers. And the thought that I can be here with both of you is one of the most humbling moments of my life. Both of you shatter the violent myth of human exceptionalism, that we are the only species that lives and breathes and loves on this planet. Here, now, what you remind us over and over again, every sentence, is we are not alone. The philosopher Mary Midgley writes, the ultimate act of anthropocentrism is to assume that other species do not feel, do not suffer, are not sentient beings. If the taboo against anthropocentrism is being lifted slowly, Robin Wall Kimmer and Richard Powers are riding our way toward a more inclusive future where community can be viewed as all life forms, plants, animals, rocks, rivers, and human beings. I see the work that you do on the page and in the world as a redistribution of power. As we learn to sharpen through you our capacity to listen, to see, to pay attention to the living world, to those we live among in the plant and animal kingdoms, we are beginning just barely to understand what Native people have remembered. As Henry Beston has written, these are not underlings, these are other nations. Welcome. It is an honor to be in conversation with the two of you. I'd like to dedicate tonight to William Merwin, who passed away on the Ides of March. He would have loved that. Maybe he planned it. One of our greatest poets. I remember Mark Strand when he was living in Utah, teaching at the University of Utah. We were at one of those awkward gatherings, socially. And we were talking about Merwin. And he said, oh, Merwin. He was probably our generation's, no, he was our generation's greatest poet until he started writing about trees. <laughs> <laughs> when I told William that, he said, oh, and if Mark had only come to visit. <laughs> <laughs> outsider art, outsider literature. We belong to this tradition, too often viewed within the academy as soft, sentimental, and at times nostalgic. For those of us within the Harvard Divinity School community, we are especially grateful to have you here at this moment. And many of us view your presence as fortuitous, as auspicious, a blessing. Pick your word. We need your wisdom. And it would not be honest if we did not bring to the table what we are facing as a frame for this conversation. On Friday, the tree at the center of the Divinity School, the Divinity Tree, is being cut. A 150 to 200 year old red oak deemed uh, on the down turn with hollow limbs, so says the particular report from an arborist. The question now is, what do we do with this moment? What is the nature of ceremony? How do we bear witness? And what comes afterward? So here's my questions to begin our conversation. What are we afraid of? How shall we live? And as Dean Kelsey coined last night in our conversation, what is the politics of the unseen? Richard, you write, trees stand at the heart of ecology 
and they must come to stand at the heart of human politics. So this is where we are. A collision, a collusion of values. They are economic, they are ecological, and spiritual at once. I hear your voice. Why didn't you do something? You who were there. We tried. We tried. Restoring land, you write, Robin, land without restoring relationship is an empty exercise. How do we restore this relationship here, now, at this place? W.S. Merwin writes, quote, I want to tell what the forests were like. I have to speak in a forgotten language. So the question I would like you both to address is, what is the forgotten language? I think we should start by acknowledging what, whatever the right word for the wrong word, which is coincidence, should be, that Robin, I, I am just back from Hawaii in a visit to Merwin's Palm Forest, and Robin's on her way there next week, or, or two weeks from now. Wow. So, wow. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I went out, it, can you hear in the back? Taking technology into my own hands here. <laughs> I feel empowered. Better? In the back? Yeah, yeah good. So, so I said that I, I am just back from Hawaii as a guest of the Merwin Conservancy and have just visited the extraordinary palm forest that he left as, as, as one of his legacies. And, and Robin is on her way there in, in a matter of one or two weeks. Um, I, I had the pleasure of, of spending remarkable time with him when I was younger. And I had hoped to see him on this visit. And he was in his last days and company was not uh, possible, but I did visit the 11 acres of world that he transformed. He took spent farmland on the island of Maui, and over the course of 40, 40 years, 45 years, he transformed it into what may be, by many measures, the most extraordinary collection of palms in the world, or certainly one of the most extraordinary. And he did that more or less single-handedly, not to make it, but simply to be planting. He just did it every other day. He just brought something out and planted it. As a result, I mean, they've ended up with, with several thousand palms. 450 plus species from all over the world just because a man thought this would be an interesting practice just to have something to order his week and to make him present to, to where he was. The land was spent uh, whatever that meant whatever that means and now it's it's like walking through the world's palm forests in the course of 11 acres, not unlike walking through the Arnold Arboretum and, and seeing these uh, creatures brought from all, all terrains and all climbs together into, into a single place. It's absolutely extraordinary, and, and you'll see it soon. Um, but it, it, what interests me again is, is this idea that there, this, this isn't science. In fact, when, when the Conservancy brought the scientists in to look at the palms and, and tell them, you know, uh, uh, how, how, what is the value here? They said, well, since he wasn't especially careful about provenance and, you know, accession records, we can't really use it as a scientific tool. Yeah. It was never his point, and it's, it, 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 it's simply one of the most extraordinary spots for being present to place that I've ever st stood in. I'm 
I'm eager to stand in that place and to feel that power of presence and the power of restoration, of healing spent land and that, and that presence. I also would like to respond to your question that brought tears to my eyes that you should ask, what are we afraid of? What are we afraid of that Merwin was not afraid of? Not afraid of in that act of replanting that place. And I worry that we are, at root, afraid of acknowledging the grave mistakes that we have made. The grave underestimate of the sentient beings who are around us, of, of imagining, uh, well, feeling that wound of knowing that we are surrounded by intelligences. Let me see if I can. Let me just do this. Is that okay? Yeah. That we are surrounded by intelligences other than our own, that we have dismissed, harvested as if they were commodities, as if they were just stuff. I think that we are afraid of the pain that will come from that and a pain of the humbling that comes from that, of acknowledging the mistake that we've made to not realize that we are surrounded by our relatives who have cared for us all along and that we have um, uh, reciprocated their generosity and, and their care with uh, blindness. I think that's one of the things that we're deeply afraid of and so we maintain this posture of human exceptionalism. We create arguments and, and rationales for, for why there are these others um, need to be under our control, that these are others are our property. And um, I think that's what we're afraid of, is, is, is the pain of acknowledgement. Um, and with the advances in science that are coming fast and furious, I can't think of a single study where anyone has um, proven that the world is dumber than we think. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> And, and we are approaching that time of reckoning, and it's deeply interesting to me of how will we react when we, when we all come to recognize the, the um, intelligences that are around us and, and the way that we have, um, the disrespectful, dishonorable ways that we have interacted with them. Robin, you mentioned that we're afraid of the grief. We're afraid of feeling something. Um, I remember one of the, the last times I was with Merwin and Paula, um, my brother had just passed away. And when we met, I've known William for 30 years, and he looked at me and he said, what's wrong? And I told him, and I started to weep, and he just held me and said, um, I know where to go. And he took Brooke and I um, to this particular uh, precipice. It was a, a beautiful ledge, one of the folded cliffs he writes about. And, and we just looked out over the water. And he never said anything. You know, we just watched the water, the waves, the erosion, the birds. Um, the, we just immersed ourselves in, in, in this place. We went back to their house, and Paula and Brooke were talking in the living room, and William said, come to my study, which was this inner sanctum. And I walked in, and he shut the door, and I just sobbed. And he just stood there and let me. And then he looked at me with those steel blue eyes, and he said, this, this is the place we write from. Never forget, this is the place we write from. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> so we are afraid of dying. And I think consequently we're afraid of creatures 
that are so much larger and older than us. I mean, to, to, to think about a tree, an individual bristlecone pine that's older than writing, it's, it's a terrifying thing. You know, to, to think, uh, like, like Frank Remote says, that we were born in the middle of things, we live in the middle of things, and we die in the middle of things, that's not a good story. So, you know, so there, there's this impulse to make sure that no one else gets out of here alive. You know, to some extent, we take revenge on creatures that seem to have a much more integrated and continuous existence than we do. And I, I think that's a small instance of being, well, if, you, if you grow up in a culture that tells you that there is no meaning except the, the, the meaning that you make for yourself. It's terrifying at first to think that there might be meaning out there. And, and I, I think the impulse toward mastery and the impulse to control starts in that sense that I'm going to die and all of this is going to keep going. But I've been told that the only meaning the only access to meaning that I have is my own life. I want revenge on everything out there. I think that there's an element of that in the way that we've reduced other sentient beings and other moral agents to resources. And I think that that's coupled with our great desire to continue to see ourselves as in control on the top of everything and and it was kind of an immortality project i think i think you're you're exactly right and what is that place that we write from and, and tell those those stories um, because that place that holds that really deep well of grief is for me the same place that holds the joy and that they are partners um, and so yes we we write from the tension of of that of that place and I think to tie these threads together that notion of being afraid to become part of the earth again that ultimate reciprocity that and there's a, there's a for me in the worldview that I inhabit there's a what that sacred time when you get to become humus, the, the, the root of that wonderful word of humility, of human and soil. Um, um, to me, that, that is a place that I want to live in and write from too, of that, that place of humus and, and the willingness to be part of that, to feel my whole self interdigitated with all those lives that came before like, um, I'm sorry, I'm a botanist, like root hairs, <laughs> penetrating <laughs> those <laughs> air spaces, you know? Um, yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a matter, I think, in saying that, it, makes, it r reminds me that we either think that the world is a source of belongings, all for us, right. or it is a most profound sense of belonging, um, whether we came from and would return to. I love, um, in your chapter, The Three Sisters, how you say um, they should be writing the story. It, it, it should be them who tell this story. And then in another chapter you talk about, it's all about the pronouns. Um, could you talk about those two things and leave them together? Y yes. Um, <laughs> if, if there are <coughs> scientists in the room, and I know there, there are, and heck, any just speaker of English, the notion that, especially in, in, in our scientific technical writing, that we must it the world. Mm. That these, these beloved teachers, these, these, these sources of knowledge for us, we can refer to only with great distance as, as to be objective and to call them it, whether we're doing technical writing or whether we're speaking English. We have to it the world. Mm. And, you know, just to bring that home, I would never say of my dear friend, it is sitting at the table. <laughs> right? Um, right? That, I'm sorry. I mean, that's, 
that's rude. I, I've, I've taken something away from you and made you no different than this table. Um, and that is, in English, how we are um, constrained, aren't we, um, to speak of the living world, um, that we it nature. We have no other way to do it. Mm. And it, it strikes me as the perfect language for capitalism. Oh, yeah. There's a, there's a moment in my story where, where two people are doing a tree set 200 feet above the earth in a, in a giant redwood that's slated to be cut. And they're holding a perpetual banter with the cutters who show up every day to see if these folks are still sitting up in the tree. And at one point, the cutter says, you know, come on down. We can talk about it. We won't hurt Mimas. And there's this instant when, when the people up in the tree say, ah, we got them to call it by its name. <laughs> Step one. <laughs> yes. Richard, you know, in your characters, they each, we, we see where they begin, where you start these profiles, and we see the transformation and how they're all drawn to trees right. by the end. And they are transformed. We as readers are transformed. Mm. Um, I'm wondering, as the writer, were you transformed? Mm. Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, the reason I, I wrote these nine Road to Damascus stories is because I couldn't get mine out of my head. You know, I... I I, I went from being absolutely ridiculously tree blind at 55 you know, to the worst kind of convert, and and, and you know there's there's nothing worse than a than a recent convert. Um, no, it was pathetic, and you know I mentioned this last night. Um, I I I I couldn't I couldn't tell an ash from an elm. I I. You know, forgive me, I'm, you, Robin's heard this and Terry's heard this already. Um, I, knew, I knew what a maple looked like, you know. But I, I also put sweet gum and sycamore into that category. They were just strange looking maples, you know. And, <laughs> and I, I, could, I would see a, you know, a tulip popper and say, wow, what happened to the top of that you know, maple leaf? You know, it, it, it's, it was just a blur. It, there was a frilly green blur out there that was occasionally aesthetically pleasing, you know, <laughs> but purely functional, you know. Um, to this moment of aha, um, which happened to me because I happened to be standing in front of a, 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 an escapee up on uh, Skyline Road above uh, Silicon Valley uh, in the Central Peninsula that was... 30 feet across and 300 feet tall and almost as old as Jesus, you know. I'm not proud of the fact that it took something that size to, to effect this conversion. But once the conversion was underway, everything, everything, everything changed. And, and you know, I went back out east to the forests and the trees that I had grown up near and, and thought I knew. And the, 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 the most banal thing was now a mystery and, and painful. I mean, you say, you say, what are we afraid of? We're afraid of deep feeling. You know, we're af afraid of being vulnerable in the face of something so magnificent. You know, and I, I kept reading if you want to see what an Eastern, you know, I, I was immersed in this research. I, I read, you know, over 100 books on trees and, and you know, the sudden realization that meaning was out there, you know, changed everything that I, that I read. And I kept reading that if you want to see what an Eastern forest looked like, an Eastern broadleaf forest looked like before the crazies got here, um, you had to go to the Smokies because there's still 120,000 acres of, of uncut forest in, in Great Smoky Mountain National Park. And I went down there four years ago as, as part of my research. And you don't have to be capable of seeing too much 
as you walk up from a second growth forest into, into an uncut forest, into a primary forest, into a forest that looks very much like it probably would have looked like 10,000 years ago, to see the, the difference, I mean, it, the, the quality of the light is different, the sound is different, the smell is different, the species count is different. Um, and here I was for the first time thinking, this is what my forest, this is what a functioning, intact forest looked like everywhere in my country, and I'd never seen it before. And, you know, eight months later, I was still thinking about that. And I, I went back and I bought a house and I've been living there ever since, full time. And, you know, you say, you say, how does that road to Damascus change you? You know, it used to be that my sense of worth in the world was contingent upon my writing a thousand words every day. You know, if I didn't do it, I would start that, that slight sense of existential panic. Am I going to remember how to do it? Is it going to be there, you know, day after tomorrow? You know, have, I'm, am I a decent person? You know, have I paid my rent today? Um, now, it's, if I don't walk four miles, if I don't get out there under, under these trees, it's not a good day. Uh, the, my, my sense of, of the, what I see and, and, and how I want to see it and, and uh, what constitutes time well spent is entirely different now. Thank you. You know, Robin, I, I'm reminded, you know, you, you talk about the redwoods, these big trees, and I'm reminded of the story you tell um, about moss you know, seeing this moss on the stone, and you were so excited and impassioned, um, both braiding in, as you do so eloquently, what it means to be a Potawatomi woman, um, indigenous roots in place, also a scientist. And one of your students said, and I'm gonna paraphrase this poorly, but is this your religion, you know? <laughs> and, and you stop and you think, where do I go? Can you share that with us, and, and maybe where, where do you see your transformation? Mm. Or how do you respond to it, and, and that notion that you were sharing about kinship, kin, key? Yeah. Um, I remember so clearly that moment, and it was in the Smokies. Oh. Um, it was oh, wow. um, above your home, and, and my students and I were both transfixed. We were there, and in spring, and Copeland got it right about Appalachian oh Spring. Oh my God. Oh, um, yeah. o only these two could have gotten me out of this place in the spring. I, <laughs> two days before leaving, I was on the trail, and there were two dozen species of ephemerals on the trail. I know, I, I want to follow you. <laughs> <laughs> we should have held this We talk still have there. snow on the ground. <laughs> no, but in that moment when I was teaching at a small college in the Bible Belt. And so when a student asked me, is this my religion? Knowing that there was a huge gulf between our ways of understanding that, I just really hemmed and, and, and hawed. Um, as, as you might imagine, I, it was also my first job. So I thought <laughs> I, I probably ought to be a little careful here. <laughs> um, um, but is it? Yes, <laughs> in, in the broadest sense of that word, of the sense of belonging and, and, and meaning. And the notion of, I, I'm glad, to, I'm always glad when anybody asks me about moss, um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you could say about moss what you just beautifully said about your forests, um, of that sense of unending mystery and curiosity that is present in a tiny little moss forest, and, and the spiritual practice of being on your knees to see these beings, the fact that, that you don't see them if you're not paying attention. You don't see them if you're walking too fast. You don't see them if you're in your head all the time and always looking up um, for things that are bigger and more powerful than you. But when you take the time, it is that same rush, it's, it's euphoria. I mean, I've been doing this 
for decades, and I still get that same rush of mystery of, of entering into a world that isn't mine, but is so fully inhabited by these, these beings who know all about what it is to be a moss. They are fully present and, and, mm. and, and being in place. They are little sovereign green beings, and, and, uh, and uh, it, it is always humbling just to be, to be in their presence. Um, it's a kind of awe that we usually associate with the grand, um, but is in fact present at the, at the miniature as well. You talk about um, mushrooms and the Potawatomi word. Can you talk about that? Oh, I'd love to. Um, in the Potawatomi language, of which I am a very beginning student, um, has some, for me, words for things that we do not have in, in English. And, and for me, one of the most powerful of those words is associated with that little bed of moss, be on your knees, come into that little forest, and, and you look and there's going to be a little mushroom pushing up from there. And Kiwe Danokwe, a wonderful ethnobotanist, Ojibwe woman, elder, um, she gave the, the word for that. And the word is papoi. Mm. And it means the force that causes mushrooms to push up from the earth overnight. And um, as I've written, that that is the moment that I knew I had to learn my language um, because of that, that power of observation, not only of the, the word isn't for the mushroom, is it? It's, it's the word for a force um, and an energy and an agency that animates the world. And um, since then, I've learned that there are other words for these forces that Western science does not even have language for. We might explain the mechanism by which it works. And oftentimes, as scientists, we confuse knowing the mechanism with knowing the meaning. Mm. Um, but, but our ancestors did not make that mistake. They named the forces separately. There is a force for sap rising. There is a force for that which propels the opening of buds into leaves um, for all of these mysteries. You know, back to this word religion, I'm not sure what it would have meant to your student, but it means something for me to remember that the etymology of that word means tying back together. Religio, yes, right, to, to ligate back together. So insofar as being on your knees in front of the moss forest is a, is a reuniting of you and something else, then it is a religious act. And I love that, that tying. <laughs> Brother. <laughs> that tying together. It makes me think of the mycelium. Yeah. You know, in the forest floor when you see that white connective tissue, almost like lace. Yeah. And when I read your piece, you know, that word, I, I really experienced it almost like a fist coming up with that fruiting body of the mushroom. Knowing, you know, different people have moments with the gifts that are theirs. And this force, this resistance, insistence, it... it all of a sudden, I started thinking about community differently. I started thinking about how we're connected differently. And in your book, Richard, you know, for me, one of the most powerful parts, and I think about, again, this politics of the unseen and the seen, um, is this resistance insistence that your characters emerge in. And what do we do with that? You know, there's that haunting scene with Patricia. Um, where she's asked the question, what's the most important thing we can do for the earth? Can you talk to us about, you know, and I have to be honest, this is a difficult one for me, my, um, and we're friends. Uh, um, my brother hung himself in July, and we had a, a very candid conversation in April. And what he said was, I have the rope. And you know, when someone you love says that, you take that seriously. And we, we did, we talked about it. And he just said, Terry, you know, the world is fucked, I'm fucked, and you're in denial. And You've got to let go. You've got to let go of the earth. You have to let go of me. Um, it's over. 
And I remember saying to him, I will never give up on you. I will never give up on the earth. Because of that force, because of the mycelium that holds us together. And in your book, when here is this powerful character who brought forward the notion that trees communicate, and then she was chastised, you know, thrown out of the academy. And in this moment, in another lecture at another time, can you talk to us about unsuicide? This oh is the question yeah. as your reader I want to ask you, and unfortunately, we're doing it publicly. <laughs> <laughs> but Well, e everything is done publicly. <laughs> Right, because there always there's always something listening. Right, mm. I the story of Mimi Ma's father, the inexplicable suicide. I got from a dear friend, and she, her father also told her, "I have the gun." Um, and I, and I think I think the bewilderment, and again, the etymology of that word is crucial. The the return of our state to a wild state, the bewilderment that we feel in the presence of someone else's hopelessness is unanswerable. I, and if if I did not now believe that meaning was out there and, and not simply living and dying with us each individually, I, I would be your brother. But the, you referenced the work that Patricia is involved in. The discovery, the recent discovery Trees in a forest are richly and robustly connected underground by fungal intermediaries and sharing both sugars and hydrocarbons and secondary metabolites in a kind of massive Medicare for all. You know, <laughs> um, you know, that you cannot undo. <laughs> You know, it, it becomes much more astonishing when you realize, as Suzanne Simard de demonstrated, that Douglas firs are doing resource sharing with birches. And as we learned from Paul Montos yesterday, the oaks are doing it with pines. You know, any sense that we have that it's every individual for itself out there, that it's a competition among, you know, ruthless, in, you know, individual forces is completely you know, laid waste to by this vision of massive interconnection. That notion of we, that, that we are not alone and we are nurtured by each other is, is a powerful sense of resilience in the face of stress. And we know that those, these networks have, been, um, have evolved and been created in response to how do we deal with shortage, with stress, with those things that, that propel undoing. And the answer is that we rely on each other, you know, we share. Um, in, in thinking about the, the, the evolution of mutualisms, it has been, shown for some organisms, lichens are the ones I could speak to, that when you put together those two symbionts of a lichen, and you put them together in an, a laboratory atmosphere which is, has everything that they need when things are abundant, they give each other the cold shoulder. They have no interest in, in symbiosis. When you stress them, when you start to take everything away, something happens to them and they know that they need to team up, and that's when lichens form. That's when lichens form, and to me that's a powerful lesson of the resilience that comes, and a lesson for a time of climate change and yeah. resource so shortage of our own making, that what does the world say that we should be doing in this time? Um, isolating one another, um, reveling in individualism and cutting off our ties 
to one another to into the natural world? Of course not. It says come together, come together, and and you know both of you have to bring your gifts to the table in a just way. Um, That's right. And, and I take that as a as a lesson. That's right. For our time. There, there is no environmental issues that's separate from issues of justice. No. And, no. and, and that's unsuicide, right? That's someone saying the ultimate, the ultimate source of power of narrative is that word nevertheless. I mean, that's, that's where all our stories come down to. You know, it's, it's, it all ends, it all changes, it's all lost, nevertheless. For, for a moment we are here and for a moment we are part of a community that we can't even see to understand. I love that um, line, be still and feel. Mm. We don't do that enough. Be still and feel. Well, and we're back to, to Robin's act of attention, which requires getting down on your knees. And mm -hmm. you know what? I, I, I said this yesterday too. Um, Robin's books profoundly changed me uh, as I was writing mine. Um, and, and in particular, it was this realization that the power of stillness is also the power of magnification. And you know, Robin points out this astonishing thing in Gathering Moss where um, the, it, the relative sizes of, of mosses, if you go from the, the, the ones that are closest to their fundament to the, be like a, Shining club moss, or something that towers, you know, inches high above, uh, above the base. It, that ratio is the same as the ratio between a blueberry bush and a redwood. So if I wanted my redwood, I could stop, magnify, and see it in the club moss. And I have a trail near the house. It's it's one of the closest to my house, Chestnut Top, on the on the north side of the park. It's it. I call it the Robin Wall Kimmerer Trail because you know the first <laughs> 300 yards of it is just a magnificent uh, um, treasure trove of non-vasculars. It's just the perfect breeding ground for it. And and sometimes I feel, you know, driven to to get up to the top of the ridge and get up into the pine oaks and keep moving and seeing, seeing the world at, you know, uh, you know, from up above and getting that big view across the, across the ridges. Sometimes I never make it out of that first 300 yards because you know, there in, in, in a patch 18 inches across is a whole forest within a forest. Yeah. But that requires stillness. The audience, you have been still. <laughs> and let's open it up for questions for the next 30 minutes. So I, I just, I, it, it just flashed into my mind that the stillness that you were advocating and the neverthelessness that I was advocating are both in that word still. We hold still, but still. Questions? Yes. yes, and we have someone that's helping us. So. Um, there's a question in the back. Thank you so much. I've noticed an immense amount of kindness that you share when you speak to each other and when you share your stories. I've also noticed that when you describe the plants and trees, you have this kindness that with which you use the words. And I've also noticed there is a shift when you speak about people. Um, there is, and there are two questions. One 
is what kind of self-kindness practice do you have in your life? And second is I'm wondering if to be able to see kindness in trees and in nature, one needs to cultivate self-kindness first to be able to share it, to be able to see the same beauty in people um, with the same magnifying glass and with the same kind of silence and pause. Thank you. Thank you for that question, which just has my mind reeling about kindness and the way we experience it and, and, and give it away. First, your question about um, self-kindness. Um, I'm reminded that in our creation story, sweetgrass is the bearer of kindness. Um, it's always the one who is, is there to, um, to come in, to fill in empty places with kindness. Um, and so it's, it's in our teachings, it is, it is a property of those plants to bring that to us. I think in reflecting on, the, on what feels like almost an implicit question of, of speaking of plants with kindness and maybe of people less so, um, um, is for me the notion, and again, you know, it's held in our, in our language, though this, the same word for berry, of uh, berry plants, of which there are many, it is the same, it's the word is min, and it, it's the same word as gift. And so we understand the plant world as a bearer of gifts, one of those gifts being kindness, the, the other gifts of, of food and, and, and medicine and, and beauty and, and teachings and all of those. And that, that, in a sense, plants give their bodies away in these acts of generosity, reciprocity, and, and kindness. But those of us who are living an animal body, who can't photosynthesize, we can't give our bodies away in that same gifting sense. So it, the kindness that we, the gifts that we have to give are different. They might be the gifts of stories. They might be the gifts of, of, of creativity, of putting, of restoring the earth, of, of science, of art. And, and so I think that when I, th that notion of kindness and self-kindness is to remind ourselves of what our gifts are that, that, that we have to give as well, and to, and, and to nurture those gifts the way that, that plants nurture berries. That's, I guess, what I'd like to say about that. I have to say... I have to say that the biggest gift that I received while writing this book was a kind of a honorary membership into the world of plant people because they, they are remarkably generous and, and, and gentle um, in, in a way that I was not before I wrote this book. Um, the other capacity that, you, that your question asks about that is demonstrating that also to large mammalian bipeds, that's been trickier. I mean, I, I went to the woods to live deliberately. <laughs> Somehow I knew you. I have to say it. I've heard that. <laughs> but also to get away. I mean, I, I, was, I was in a rough spot. And, and having, you know, 800 miles, square miles of wilderness in my backyard was very attractive. And I would I would pick the trails based on how how you know how little chance I had for seeing other people you know <laughs> you know and and I gradually did get my feet back on the ground and it's a lovely figure of speech right <laughs> and so that the ground could come up into me but you know the, my 
my friends and family would say, aren't you afraid being out on, you know, 9, 10, 11 miles down a trail, you know, without having seen anybody? What if you run into a bear? You know, there are two bears per square mile in the Smokies. And, you know, I always want to say, it's not the quadrupeds I'm worried about. You know, it's the guy in the camel who's coming you know, down the trail in the other direction. But enough conversations with enough of my own kind out there really did open my eyes to a lot of things. People, people want something that they're not getting now. And if we are mean to each other, if we're angry, and if we do exceptionally cruel things, it, it's often because of species loneliness. It's often because of soul nostalgia. It's often because we are just so homeless now. Um, and that's why in my book, one of the characters is called, there's a, it's too, too difficult to set up, but uh, she begins to hear voices and the voices are telling her the most remarkable creations, the most remarkable creatures need your help. And she pursues this as a, as a defense of trees, these that's often thousand-year-old creatures, you know, that, that are operating on these unfathomable scales with infinitely complicated behaviors. And it's only through a series of reverses and reveals that she realizes it's actually the humans that need our help. Yeah. I, that's not giving too much away for people who haven't read the book. <laughs> but that's been my journey as well. And full disclosure, disclosure um, I'm really angry. And, you know, with a name like Tempest. Um, <laughs> I'm going to move it, now. It, it, <laughs> so I may look kind, but I'm really not. And um, the way I rationalize that is, you know, I hope that I can take my anger and turn it into sacred rage. And I think that's why I write. Um, and I'll never forget, um, I have a dear friend, Willie Gray Eyes, who's a Navajo elder, Diné, and after Bears Ears was gutted um, by Donald Trump, 85%. These are lands sacred to the Hopi, the Navajo, the Zuni, the Ute, Mountain Ute. Um, I went down to where he lives, and I, I said, Willie, what do I do with my anger? And he said, Terry, this is not the time for anger. This is a time for healing. And I'm really struggling. You know, I'm angry about the divinity tree. I'm angry that I couldn't do something. I'm angry that it's being killed. And I don't know where kindness comes in. You know, I'm trying to be gracious. I don't want to lose another job. Um, <laughs> you know, I've only been here two years. Um, can, can sacred rage also be a gift. I mean, you're trying I mean, to give us something. It's, you know, I think we have to come to grips with who we are and who we aren't. And as a Westerner, you know, I am seeing my home ground um, raped, raised, whatever metaphor you want to use. Um, and it's hurting the people. And it's hurting the animals. And it's hurting the plants. It's destroying community. And I have to gather my energy. And to me, the kindness comes in the form of, of, of fierceness, that we can be fierce and compassionate at once. Yes. And we can't do it alone. But here and this and this, things are shifting. And, it, and we can change our pronouns in both the human world and the wild. Question. Okay. Um, I, I want to thank you all for this and for acknowledging all of these really profound thoughts and for acknowledging the anger that many of us feel about the divinity tree. Um, and I don't know how to ask this question, but how do we forgive ourselves for not doing more? and for not being able to do more. This collision of values is really sticking with me because I'm in the political life here and 
my days are and nights are one long collision of values, human, human exceptionalism. How do we forgive ourselves for, for letting these things happen? Can we? I mean, I have to say, and, and then to my friends, you know, I really, I love that the dean of the Divinity School, um, the first act he and Luann, his wife, did were take acorns to the arboretum and propagate them. That, to me, is a gesture of forgiveness. That, to me, was a gesture saying there is going to be another future. Um, given where we find ourselves here at Harvard University. And to me, those seeds, those acorns are the beginning of forgiveness. And can we have enough faith at the Divinity School to give them the ground they need to propagate and not replace it, as Ned, you were saying, with a big tree that then fills the space? Can we live with that open space we have created and believe that 200 years from now, there will be other people that follow us that can put their hands on that tree and close their eyes and feel the power of this tree. To me, that is an act of forgiveness. And as a community to come together and say, it's not over. When the tree is cut, when the divinity tree is in the chipper, as Rosetta has, has said, we need to face this, that's just the beginning of who we really can become. And in that forgiveness, in the planting of the acorns, to me, the, the word restoration, the healing, uh, the, the way that we as human people can participate in healing, in the physical landscape. But I'm reminded of our friend Gary Nabhan's wonderful words that in order to, when we do ecological restoration, which might be the, the beginning of healing, we must also do restoration. And I think in, in my brief visit to the tree mm -hmm. and to stand in the circle of people who care so much about this and to feel the, the, the reciprocity of emotion between uh, the tree and those, and, those, and those people. I think for me, a wound that was very palpable for me is the lie that's told about the story about that tree, um, that you know it has to come down, et cetera, et cetera. But what, what I mean is that it's the story, the restoration where the healing lies not only in the physical restoration, but of telling the story. We have so many monuments around this country to what we uphold as the great and the good. I think that we need monuments to wounds. We need monuments to stupidity. We need monuments to arrogance. And, and that that's a restoration to say we were wrong. It's back to that beginning. We're afraid that we're doing wrong. And we are. And we should commemorate that. We should remember this. And then plant the oaks. But I think we need to tell the truth about that story first. Yeah, no, nothing to add to, to truth as a necessary prerequisite for anything to happen, except to say that I, I've been on the road now for almost a year for this book, and everywhere I go, there's a divinity tree. Every town that I stop in, and you know the people who come up afterwards, they, they don't really want their book signed. They want to say, this is what happened here, you know, and, and I, I have just, I, I've completely surrendered to, to listening to those stories for as long as it takes in every venue, because whether it's, you know, whether it's uh, Sheffield, England, or Los Angeles, somebody's got something to say about a crime that's still underway, mm -hmm. a crime caused by anger and pain that hasn't been acknowledged or, or named. And, and that's why I think naming it has to happen first before there can be, be any healing. Is there a student that we can hear from? Yes. Uh, my
Mervyn, in one of his poems, uh, for a coming, coming extinction, writes, uh, tell him that we who follow you invented forgiveness and forgive nothing. Uh, and he goes on to write, uh, the, the bewilderment will diminish like an echo. Uh, and I wonder, following Mervyn, whether questions of forgiveness or healing are already too late uh, and whether we have the tools to recognize uh, that lateness. Uh, that the short question being, uh, do we have the analytics to realize that perhaps it's already too late? Uh, I think we certainly don't have the an analytics to calculate too late because we don't even know w what we'd be too late for. Um, in other words, the history of life on Earth is the history of one thing becoming another thing, transformation, endless, endless transformation. And whatever happens to us, it's not going to be too late for what becomes. Um, I, we can never make a calculation on the effects of anything that we do. And so we're thrown back on that fundamental ethical requirement of simply being present and being engaged. Yes. We have some questions over here as well. All three of you are operating from and, and coming from a really beautiful paradigm of belonging. And you talked about the other paradigm of belongings as a shorthand. And I often wonder about, it's kind of a teaching and learning question. You know, what is the fastest route? You, you're all writing, which is a beautiful teaching for each of us as individuals. But I, I wonder what, what is the, what do you think is one of the, the faster routes for helping us as humans change paradigms? How do, how do we teach that? And, and maybe we don't need speed, um, right? I mean, w w recovering slowness may, may be essential too. Yes, because when I think about slowness and stillness of, of trees, and all the plants. One of the things that, that strikes me about that in response to your question is that the stillness of, of trees honors relationship. That if you're going to stand in one place for centuries, you have to be really good at connection and, and, and relationship. You can't run away. You can't flee. You can't say, oh, well, I used this whole place up, so now I'll go wreck another one. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, that notion of, of, of stillness and the, and the investment in, in relationship, of making a home, I think is, is an important way. I also want to say that, of course, we all wrestle with exactly that question. Um, and one of the things that, that I, th I try to think about a lot, because when I feel my own powerlessness against Monsanto, when I feel my own powerless against powerlessness against these forces that are arrayed against us, I, you know, you can go to despair, right, and feel, wait, how could we do this? But I think that the one thing that I do have in my power to change is how I think, and, and I was going to say what, I will say who I love in the world. Um, and and that, that change in one's own being, to say this is what I stand for, this, this is how I see the world. I see the world as kin. I see the world as, as belonging. But if I only say that to myself, if I only feel that and feel alone and isolated in a world which is falling apart, the medicine is to share those thoughts. The, the medicine is, is the story. Um, and we all are story makers around our own dinner tables, with our neighbors, with our students. You know, when we give each other a vocabulary and a name for those 
uh, the world that we love. Um, we create something which is so, um, has the potential to be magnetically beautiful, that people will migrate to that way of thinking because it's so deeply satisfying and cultivates a sense of belonging. Since we're sitting next to each other, we'll maybe just ask both questions. Um, thank you, each of you, uh, for your sharing and your vulnerability um, in public. Um, I, uh, Richard, you said um, once the conversion was underway, everything changed. And my favorite part of braiding sweetgrass um, is about <laughs> the storying of the throwing out of the coffee grounds. Uh, um, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> um, at, from which, when I read the book for the first time a couple of years ago, I developed my own daily ritual of, um, of sharing my first water of the day with the earth. Um, and, um, and this discovery, oh, well, that wasn't, there, was no meaning, there wasn't any special meaning behind it. Um, but the... The wondering is about how to get ourselves in the way of these initiatory moments of conversion. Um, how do we get our babies in the way of these moments of conversion at which point everything changes? Because if we can do that for hundreds of thousands of millions of people um, who are, for whom everything has changed, that that's part of the answer. Um, and so wondering about what are the ways that you see um, to make that happen. I'm going to take literally how do we get our babies into, into ritual and into process and into, into attention and say maybe the question is how do we make sure not to stop them? I mean, every child is, a, is is a naturalist you know, and, and, and feels that animism and feels that connection and believes that they're a part of these processes and looks at them intently you know it, it's it's the gradual accretion of this other message that no just take care of yourself that breaks that down so it's it's really a preservational issue how, how, to, how to keep them going for as long as possible. Yes. <laughs> and, and part of that is, is for me also the where. Where does it happen? And to be in the presence of the teacher. And to me, that is in the presence of, of other beings. It's being in the woods, on the prairie, um, by the water. And I don't in any way mean that, that it has to be nature out there. Um, how many conversions happen in the backyard with the tree who you love? Um, how many conversions happen with, with the moss in a sidewalk crack when you realize that there are creative, courageous beings all around you who are living with you? I think it's to be in the, in the presence, but you also have to know that you're in the presence. Thank you. Um, I feel really moved by the kindness you're sharing each other and the discussion of like spirituality and science and how that's all woven together. And I'm wondering how you've managed to survive academia. <laughs> <And> <laughs> Did we? <laughs> Did we? Because <laughs> I'm like considering academia, but like have some questions. <laughs> They're all looking at me. <laughs> I have. A I am now on. <laughs> but I love my greatest joy, my deepest joy, is being a student. Yeah. I mean, yesterday, was it yesterday, Monday? You know, we had four of the most powerful stories I have ever heard. And as we sat there around the table, 18 of us, you know, what do you do with that energy? 
And the only thing we could do was to go outside and to breathe and to howl and to say, I love you. That's how we survive the academy. And the, you know, what I love is that we have an arboretum, we have a divinity school, we have the humanities, we have the sciences, we have scientists who are coming to the divinity school saying, we know how to handle the data. We're really good at what we do. What we don't know is how to deal with our emotions. What are the tools that we need to handle our joy? What are the tools we need to handle our grief? Where's the mycelium? That's, that's how we thrive in academia. We make things, we make things together. My brother died because he was alone. I have to live with that. But he's still here because, as you've heard from both Robin and Richard, we just keep changing form. Peter, I look at your art. You know, it's the fabrics creating collage, creating landscape. We just keep creating. Each of us in our own time with the gifts that are ours. That is the academy. We can have these conversations here in this environmental forum and go out and be enlivened, inspirited together. I want to go to your university. <laughs> is, is, is there someone in admissions I can bribe? <laughs> I think that's a really good way to end. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. It was fun. This is my glass case. <laughs>